Hi friends, this is Andrea. And I'm Haley. And you're listening to Inhuman, a true crime podcast. Okay, so today we don't really have any, well, we do kind of have a little bit of just update on the Gabby Petito case, um, but we don't really have any like other news pertaining to like the podcast or anything. So Haley, take it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So really, I just wanted to give a little, it's not even really an update, but just what's going on in that case, because I know a lot of people have been following it. And basically, they are still searching for Brian Laundry. <laughs> Dude, I just started recording. Hello. What's up, motherfuckers? Bubba, come here. Robert, I put clothes out She did all the things and Bubba, look at you. <laughs> Babe, I'm recording. Hi. So anyway, before my fiance rudely burst in here, <laughs> we... There's not much update, but they're still searching for Brian Laundry. And then actually today, which is uh, a couple days before, before you'll be hearing this, but it has been reported that parts of the Carlton Reserve are actually reopened. So that's like the main area they've been searching for Brian. Yeah, I saw that. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I guess yeah. they didn't find anything. Yeah. So they haven't said why and they haven't like said where else they're searching but it seems like they've kind of stopped their search there so i feel like he was never there i don't know i agree or maybe he was there for like a hot second and then left yeah that's what i think too unless he's no longer alive and he like got eaten by an animal or something i don't believe that (laughs) that'd be too that'd be too easy i don't too good to be true yeah uh um, and then also, Andrea, before we get into the episode, do you want to announce on the podcast the genders of your babies? Oh, yeah, I can do that. We never did. Yeah. So, and also um, gave birth to a kidney stone yesterday. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll post a picture of it on our Instagram so you guys can feel sorry for me. <laughs> but it was big. It was huge. I was like, oh, my God, how did I not die? <laughs> um. It, but the good news is that I am having two little girls. So the twins are going to be girls. They're not identical, but it's still exciting. So yeah. be, I have a little boy and two little girls. That's just so crazy to me. <laughs> I'm so excited, man. He's going to be such a sweet older brother. Yeah, he really is. He's excited. I don't think he still understands that, like, I have two babies and they're going to be, like, in our lives. <laughs> 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 they're gonna come and he's gonna be like wait a minute i thought uh-uh, you were I just didn't joking for this. yeah <laughs> he's like my mama <laughs> <laughs> no i think he's gonna be the sweetest yeah i think he'll be a big helper so that'll be good well i'm excited for you so i guess we did have a little podcast yeah. update even though it wasn't like for the podcast but we're we are the podcast so exactly so yeah so that's all the news or updates that we have for you guys today Um, So now I'm just going to dive right into the case that I'm covering this week. And uh, Haley and I were talking about it before we started recording. And neither one of us really knew a lot of the details of this case. Like, I had kind of heard it in passing. Like, I don't think I've ever heard another podcast cover it. um, Except for, so let me just say this really quick, I guess. So about six or seven pages into my research, if that tells you how long this is going to be, um, <laughs> I actually did come across a podcast that was dedicated to this case. Oh, wow. Um, so I binged, listened to it. It was There were short episodes. There were like 20-minute episodes. And they gave a lot of background to like the area and like the host of the show, like she's from that area originally. Um So it wasn't, like, it was mostly about the case, but she gave a lot of, like, geography and, um, like, historic kind of information, which was nice just to have. So I did go in and tweak some of my notes a little bit after listening to that um, because there was some stuff in there that I had never heard um, in all the research that I had done. So um, I will link that podcast in the show notes for sure, because um, it is a good listen, and it's a quick listen if you just need something to listen to, like on the drive to work or while you work out or whatever. Awesome. So I'm going to be covering the Springfield Three. 
All right. I'm excited to hear it because I really know almost nothing, I feel like. So I think at first when you told me you were covering this, I was thinking you were going to cut. It was the West. What is it? Westfield? West Memphis. West Memphis 3. Yeah. Yeah. So at first I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard that one. But then when I looked at it again and you said you were covering the Springfield 3, I was like, wait a minute. That's not it. I don't think I know <laughs> that much about yeah. this one. So I'm excited. I could see. Yeah, I could definitely see how you would confuse those because, I mean, it's very similar. And people, a lot of the like um armchair detective type people they call this case um the three missing women or t3w for short okay so these are the people that are really invested in this case like i I did read some of the um what is it like reddit kind of websites where people have their theories and all that stuff um and i saw a lot of referencing to that like name um okay but for the sake of this podcast i'm going to be calling them the springfield three and they do have names so i will be calling them by their names awesome in the early morning hours of june 7th 1992 suzanne Susie streeter stacy mccall and Susie's mother cheryl levitt seemingly vanished into thin air what happened to these women and why are there still so many unanswered questions almost 30 years later so it's been about, let me think, it was 92, so that's like, what, 29? 20? Yeah. Yeah, 29 years, so not quite 30 years. So in 1992, Springfield, Springfield, Missouri was considered a safe, family-friendly area. It was a tight-knit community, kind of the everybody knows everybody, everybody's in everybody's business a little bit, especially in the neighborhood that they lived in, like, you would notice if like a car was at a place or you know if there was like a visitor or something like pretty much all the neighbors would recognize okay. that and okay. be like peeping out of their window I guess. <laughs> it was the type of area like I said where everyone knew everyone. People kept their doors unlocked and there was little to no crime at that time. Wow. However, after this tra- tragic event, all of that changed forever. So, Stacy and Susie were childhood friends. They had actually met in elementary school. However, Stacy and her family had moved away for a brief period of time to Kansas. And when they returned, Stacy and Susie had, you know, grown apart as kids do. Right. Especially when you don't see each other every day. And it was the 90s. There wasn't like texting and social media and all that. Right. And Susie had started hanging with a different crowd of people. And Stacy kind of ended up hanging out with her sisters a lot. So they just didn't really necessarily cross cross paths. Susie lived with her mom Cheryl who was 47, a single mother and a hairdresser and they had moved into the home at 1717 East Del Mar just two months before the disappearance. Stacy who was 18 and Susie 19 had recently rekindled their friendship a few months before graduation and they were seen hanging out pretty frequently again They had also spent a lot of time with another friend, Janelle, who becomes a pretty important person in this case as well. Um, I'll get to a little, I'll get to that a little later. So now back to the graduation that I just mentioned, Stacy and Susie both graduated on June 6th, 1992 from Kickapoo High School. And yes, it is Kickapoo like it sounds like (laughs) Kickapoo. (laughs) So... We had, like, a, not me, but my little sister had, like, almost, it wasn't a Girl Scout tribe, but it was, like, I think they actually called it, like, Indian princesses or something at the time, which probably isn't, like, politically correct now, but (laughs) that's what it was called, and their group was called the Kickapoo tribe. I think it is a tribe. That's exactly what I think that it, you know, derived from. Um, I didn't do any research into that. Sorry, but I didn't see that it was no, very relevant. Right. <laughs> yeah. But much like many of the graduating students, and probably like you and I, the girls had plans that evening to go to some graduation parties to celebrate. They also had plans the following day to go to a water park in Branson, Missouri, um, called Whitewater which I think was about two hours away from Springfield. Originally, the girls had planned to meet Janelle that evening and drive down but you know after going to some parties they kind of decided well we'll just we'll just go in the morning you know so at 10 30 
p.m. that night, Stacy called her mom, Janice, and told her they weren't going to drive down that evening, that they were changing their plans, and they were going to sleep over at Janelle's house. They actually ended up going to more parties, and at 2.30 a.m., they went back to Janelle's to sleep over, but probably like a lot of families, there were several family members staying at Janelle's house due to the graduation, and Susie and Stacy decided that they would sleep over at Susie's instead and that they would call Janelle the following morning to make plans to meet and head down to Branson to go to the water park. So Susie and Stacy each drove their own cars back to Susie's. Janelle was the last person to see or speak to the girls before they seemingly vanished. So it was actually Janelle and her mother who talked to the girls before they left. Okay. Um, but I guess Janelle was like technically the last person to see them. From all accounts, Cheryl, Susie's mom, had a normal night. She spoke to a friend around 11.15, and the girls arrived at Susie's that morning, you know, a little after 2.30. I don't think the drive was very far from Janelle to Susie's house. Both their cars were in the circle driveway that was in front of the home, and Cheryl's was in the carport. So a lot of, a lot of Susie's friends... Um, well, a couple of Susie's friends, I should say, said that Susie would always wake her mom up to let her know that she was home safely. She would just kind of go in her room, give her a little peck on the cheek and say, hey, I'm home. I'm safe, you know. So did Susie wake her mom up that night to let her know that they were right. home safely? Did she tell her, hey, Stacy's here. She's going to spend the night because um, that was something that she did do. But we don't know. Yeah. It is apparent, though, that the girls did make it to the house in those early morning hours of June 7th. Like I mentioned before, their cars were in the driveway, but their clothing, their keys, their purses, and even their jewelry was all inside the home. That's not good. Right. Even Cheryl's purse was in the home. Another thing that was in the home was Cheryl and Susie's cigarettes which struck a chord with everyone because both of these women were known to be what's commonly referred to as chain smokers. And if you know anything about a chain smoker, they don't leave their cigarettes behind. So that was a little alarming, and I'll touch base on that a little more later as we get into the investigation. Right, and like, you know, maybe if their stuff was left behind, they might have gone outside to smoke or something, you know, left their, like, purses and everything. Yeah. But their cigarettes were also inside then that theory couldn't be true yeah like pretty much any scenario like you know a lot of people had a lot of different theories as to what they could have done like you know walked off for whatever reason but I would think you would at least take your cigarettes or at least take your purse and your clothing I mean the clothing that they were wearing that evening was just there that's really weird so around 7 a.m I think it was 7 30 Um, a.m. that morning when the girls were supposed to contact Janelle and she hadn't heard from them she decided to call and she got no answer. She called several times and then decided to head over to Susie's house to see you know if they'd overslept or what was going on. Right. Again it's the early 90s there's no cell phones no luxury of texting So they just decided to drive over there. When she and her boyfriend, Mike, arrived at Susie's home, they knocked on the door. They noticed all three cars were in the driveway, but no one answered the door. That's not good. Yeah. They also noticed that the porch light globe had been busted. So, like, the part that goes over the light bulb was busted on the front porch. The bulb itself was fine. It was on. Huh. Which they thought that was odd, too. But, you know, you don't really think too much into it when you're just trying to get in touch with your friends. Right. Um, And they also noticed that the front door was unlocked. Okay. But you did say that this area, people would leave their doors unlocked. Yeah. So it was at that point they decided to leave and come back a little later before they actually left for the water park. Just in case the three women had went on a walk or walked to a nearby breakfast spot, which I guess people did. I don't know. But still their purses were there so did they knock on the door yeah they knocked on the door no one answered did you say that maybe i missed that yeah i think i did say that (laughs) 
okay. It's okay. <laughs> I missed it. But yeah, so they knocked on the door, but at that time they didn't have any real reason to believe they weren't there. Right. Or that they were, like, that something bad happened. Right. There was no urgency, no alarm, bells ringing. You know, they were just like, huh, that's weird. Like, maybe they went for a walk or maybe they went to go get breakfast. Because at that point, they didn't know that the purses were there. Right. They just saw that they weren't answering the door, so they maybe, yeah, thought they went somewhere. So they didn't have any reason to, like, go inside and see where they were. Okay. So uh, it was reported that another friend of Susie's also stopped by that morning after she was unable to reach Susie by phone. This friend noticed right away that Susie's car wasn't parked where she normally parked it, which was very odd to her. She told police later that Susie always parked her car behind her mom's car in the carport, not in the circle. So if you think about like a one car carport, like her mom's parked there. And then she would pull in right behind her. Okay. And the friend said that unless her mom wasn't home yet or another car was parked in that spot, there would be really no reason for her not to park there. Right. Okay. Now, I don't necessarily agree or disagree that this would be odd just because it was super late. Like, maybe they had some drinks. Like, there could be such, you know, maybe she pulled in. And then her, you know, she wanted her friend to pull in behind her in the circle parking lot or the circle driveway. So, you know, it was probably odd to her friend because that was something that she always did. But again, it's not like a big red flag to me. Right. So around 1230 p.m. So just a couple of hours after about two, three hours, three and a half hours after Janelle and Mike had originally got to their home, they decided since no one was answering the door still and it was unlocked, they would just peek their heads in and check to make sure nothing was awry. But before heading into the house, they decided to sweep up the glass that was on the front porch so no one would step on it. <laughs> so I don't know how I feel about that. I think that's very, like, non teenagery <laughs> Not that that's a word. But yeah. there was a broom on the porch, so... And it and they and they told police later that they took the glass and dumped it over the fence, which there was a dentist office next door. So I was oh. like, why would you do that? Yeah, why wouldn't you like leave it in the dustpan or something? I yeah, like part of me is like, okay, like that makes sense. Glass is dangerous, but also another part of me is like, if you were planning to go see what was going on. Why take the time to do that? Right. Because at this point, you clearly have some sort of idea that something wasn't right if you decided you were going to go see. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Yeah, this was, this will be like a key thing later in the investigation. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch back on that in a moment. But I thought it was very odd as well. And the fact that they took it like and dumped it over like... Like you said, why not just leave See, it in the dustbin? That's like a teenager thing. Like that's like you're just not thinking and you're like, I'm just gonna dump it over. Like <laughs> you just weren't thinking about it. But yeah. actually sweeping it up. Yeah. Yeah. Upon entering the home, they noticed that the TV was on in the living room. And it was then that they noticed that all three of the women's purses were lined up near Susie's room. So the way I envisioned it is that there was, like, a couple of, like, step-downs before you got to where the bedrooms were, and I guess Susie's was the first one. And Cheryl's purse was, like, on the stairs, and the two girls' purses were, like, on the last stair on the floor by Susie's bedroom. Okay, so, like, if you had come in the house and gone down to the bedroom, you might drop your purse there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. While Janelle and Mike were in the home, the phone rang, And Janelle answered it, which, I don't know. I guess I would answer it, too, if, like, no one was there and, like, maybe it was them trying to get help or, I don't know. And I feel like that time and in a small town like that where, you know, everybody knew each other and whatever, like, I can totally understand that happening and I don't think it's that weird. Yeah, I don't think it's that weird either. But on the other, other side of the phone, there was a male voice and the guy was, like, making really crude remarks and so Janelle hung up. <laughs> but again, it's the 90s. 
It's graduation time. People used to, I, let me tell you, I used to prank call, when I was, especially when I was in like middle school, I used to prank call all, that's what me and my friends did on sleepovers yeah. and stuff. <laughs> Is your fridge running? Better go catch it. <laughs> but not like, hey, I want to fuck your mom, you know, like. Yeah, like. Crude. Or whatever he said. Yeah. And yeah. I just, I like, hey, like since you guys can't, yeah, you guys can't see my face, but I'm literally just here like, what? what? <laughs> but, okay. All right. Yeah. Going. So I think the fact that it was like, you know, a common thing that especially like high school, middle school kids did, Janelle didn't think much of it, but he ended up calling back again and again, he made crude remarks and hung up and eventually he called another time, but this time Janelle did not answer and he left a crude message on the answering machine as well. Oh, interesting. So that doesn't sound like very a prank diligent. Call to me. Yeah, very diligent. Right. Like we used to prank call, and it would. I mean, I wasn't born in '92, but when I was in <laughs> middle school and stuff, like we would prank call too. But it would be like yeah. funny stuff. And if somebody didn't pick up, we wouldn't keep calling them. No. And if they did pick up, you were like, "I'm never calling them again." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how it was. Unless you knew them and you were, like, trying to, you know, pull their leg or whatever you want right. to say. Maybe, like, a, a boy you had a crush on or something, you might call him more than once. But, right. again, being funny, not making crude comments. Yeah. Definitely not leaving and, a message. Like, yeah, I was going to say, and leaving a message, like, that's, yeah. Yeah. So we'll learn later, though, that this... I'm about to say voicemail, but it's not even voicemail. It's answering machine message. Mistakenly, mysteriously got deleted. Okay, so I'm getting the vibe that maybe this didn't actually happen. I don't know. We don't know. (laughs) Okay. So, also that morning, Janice, who is Stacy's mom, so the friend of Susie, called Janelle's house because she hadn't heard from Stacy, and she found out that Stacy hadn't stayed over at Janelle's that she, in fact, went back with Susie and slept over there. This was not like Stacy at all. She was very, you know, good at communicating with her mother. She always told her mom where she was going to be. Um, and this instantly worried Janice because, number one, she hadn't heard from her, da- from her daughter all morning, and she wasn't where she said she was going to be. Right. Which I get, you know, it's 2.30 in the morning, you're 18, you don't want to call your parents and be like, hey, I'm spending the night at so-and-so's house, but right, it was still alarming because Janice was so used to her, like, knowing where Stacy was. Right, like, if, yeah, I don't think, well, my parents were really strict, so maybe I would have, but I don't think Same. I would have, like, <laughs> called at 2.30 in the morning, I would have, like, called <laughs> in the next, like, the next morning and said, like, hey, here's where I am. Right. So the day continued on, and Janice, you know, was continuing to get more and more worried. She hadn't heard from her daughter all day, and she tried to get in touch with Janelle to find out where Susie lived, and she heard that Janelle was over at one of the local water slides. So instead of driving the two-ish hours to Branson, they had just decided to stay local and go to a local water slide. Which I'm assuming is because they probably spent, like, the majority of the morning trying to figure out where Stacy and Susie were. Right. And just a side note, this is probably very, like, millennial slash bordering on Gen Z of me. <laughs> because I'm literally a month short of technically being an, a millennial. But it stresses me out so much thinking that, like, they didn't have cell phones to communicate. Yeah. Like, and you just wouldn't really know where your kid was. Yeah, I mean, I lived during that time. It was, I don't know how we did it. Just thinking yeah. about, like, going places without GPS and stuff, I'm like, you know, we had MapQuest, we'd print off right. directions and stuff, but, like, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think, like, what? <laughs> how did yeah. we live? It just, like, <laughs> yeah, it stresses me out thinking about that. I'm glad we live in the time we live in. Yeah, I agree, especially for that, because it's good to, like, know where people are at all times if you need to get in touch with them. <laughs> Yes, and share your location with your friends, guys. Yeah, yeah. for the Just last time. And actually, it was it was um, interesting because one of the friends that um, they interviewed on that podcast I listened to, she said, she was like, yeah, you would go like hours, sometimes days without talking to people. 
And I'm like, yeah, I guess you would. I mean, if you didn't call your friends on the phone, like, yeah, you wouldn't text them. You know, you wouldn't right. have any other means to reach out. And that's just I mean, so crazy. Our friend Rachel is currently at Disney World with her family. And, like, so we haven't, like, been talking to her as much as normal. And I was thinking today, like, I hope she's okay. Like, I haven't heard from her. I thought the same thing this morning because I was, like, I checked it. I was, like, she didn't, she didn't post a story. She hasn't checked in but then she checked in like later this evening so i was like yeah you're alive (laughs) yeah but still it was like weird and that was what like maybe 12 hours of not hearing from her and we were like what the heck and so i can't imagine going days without hearing from friends like it's just weird i know that's what it was but yeah yeah. it was a wild time (laughs) i think i'm showing how young i am here (laughs) yeah i don't remember any of it so whatever (laughs) (laughs) so Janice and her husband, they went down to the local water slide. They found Janelle. They spoke to her and asked her where Susie lived. And then Janice headed over to Cheryl and Susie's home. Janice, like Janelle, they just, she just walked right in the house. She noticed that the TV was on and the women's purses were lined up. Their dog, Cinnamon, was there as well, which I don't know where he was in the beginning of the story because no one mentioned him Any of any of the reports that I read. And he seemed like he was beyond excited to see someone. He was like a little Yorkie, I think. Okay, but to be fair, all, like, especially little dogs, like, I could go outside for two minutes and maybe not so much Mackie, but my parents' dog, like, she's (laughs) a little Maltese and you could literally be gone for two minutes and she'll be so excited for you to come in. (laughs) So, like, that doesn't necessarily mean that he had been alone for a while. Yeah, yeah. But that was, I guess, the assumption that they made because... Interesting. You know, he was, like, so excited to see them, and he didn't know them from Adam. But, again, small dogs are like that. They're, like, all yappy and excited. Yeah. So Janice went into uh, Susie's room, and she saw Stacy's shorts that she had been wearing that evening along with her bra and her sandals and tucked into her shorts pocket was the jewelry that she had been wearing that evening so in her mind she's thinking okay my daughter is in her t-shirt and underwear getting ready for bed okay yeah and then she's missing so my daughter is in her t-shirt and underwear missing which is alarming did they not think at all that maybe she borrowed clothes that's what I was wondering too because I was like because they said, like, um, Stacy's clothes that she was wearing that night were there, and then Susie's clothes that she was wearing that evening were there, and they would have been, like, in their T-shirt and underwear getting ready for right. bed. But I was like, I used to borrow clothes, like, borrow clothes yeah. to sleep in for my friends. So I don't think that they thought that, but I think it's a possibility for sure. Okay. So Janelle didn't think anything was – weird when she saw the purses there and the tv left on no okay that's she's but you know she's a teenager so or at that time now janice the mother she she did she thought it was very odd that the purses were lined up okay but that may you know i have a set spot in my house where i put my purse yeah i i wouldn't necessarily feel it was weird that they were lined up but it would be weird that Nobody has heard from them, and their purses are there, and the TV is left on. Yeah. So, at that point, Janice decides to call the police and report her daughter missing. So, in the podcast that I listened to, she said that 911 was new in their area. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Which is also crazy to me, because I'm like, okay, 92? Like, that wasn't that long ago. 911? When did did 911 come out? Yeah. I don't even know. I, no I need clue. to, like, look that up sometime. But I'm going to look it up. But she didn't even want to call 911 because it was so new, and she thought it was, like, for emergencies, and she wasn't convinced yet that this was, like, an emergency situation. Okay, so according to one article on Google, um, nine, in January of 1968... The American Telephone and Telegraph Company announced that within its serving areas, the digits 911 were available for installation on a national scale as the single emergency telephone number. See, that makes more sense to me. Yeah. But maybe it was like, 
like you said, in certain areas. So in like, certain areas, it was rolling out. But 68 to 92, James. But I guess <laughs> I if it was like a small town, like they have to be able to set it up and yeah, have the resources. So, And I think Springfield was at that time like a pretty small area from what from the way right. they make it make it sound and, and describe okay. it so she called like the not emergency number and she spoke to someone and they said that they would send out a investigator or an officer when the investigator rick bookout arrived he saw the women's cars and he checked and all of the doors were locked so that was a good sign i guess to him because they were you know they got out of their car they locked their car Right. And they obviously made it inside the house because their belongings were there. He was a bit alarmed that the glass from the front porch had been swept up due to it being potential evidence. Mm, so interesting. Okay. They did tell him. Well, he. I guess he asked, like, why there was no bulb there. And they told, Janelle and her boyfriend told him that they had swept it up because there was glass on the ground. And that could be a sign of someone trying to put the light out so no one would see something oh. going on you know those are the thoughts in his head as an investigator right and not that there would necessarily be fingerprints on them but like a hair a fiber you know whatever so upon entering the home he checked all the rooms and he did not notice any obvious sign of struggle he did however notice that the blinds in the window of the living room so the the i'll post a picture of the house on our instagram so you can have like a better visual but if you think like a big like two window two paint not mm. pane is that what they're called two pane yeah when yeah that, window panes so it'd be like two windows side by side okay one of the blind blades was lifted as though someone had been peering out and it stuck so that was something that he pointed out that was kind of interesting because, like, maybe someone would been peering out because they heard a noise. Could have been Cheryl hearing the girls come home, looking out. Yeah. I, like, part of me, I mean, it's good that he noticed that. Yeah. But also, like, that could be anything. It could have been from days before. Right. You know, if they don't, like, open the blinds a lot or something. But if you're a freak like me, you would notice that and you would fix it right away because you don't want anyone weird looking in your house. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that's very true. But you never know. Like, that could technically be from anything. But props to this guy for noticing that because I feel like that's a very little thing. Yeah, it is. But, you know, he picked up on it and and jotted it down in his brain for later. So at that time, he did hear the answer machine. (laughs) Yeah. At that time, he did hear the answering machine message from the man who left the crude message. Oh, so he heard it. He did hear it. So it was after he had heard it that it got erased. So we don't know if he erased it or if someone else. There was reportedly 20 people in and out of the home that day that were not police or investigators. Wow. Yeah. So it could have been literally anyone. Yeah, and but but it's important, I think. I mean, I don't know this case, but somebody else other than Janelle and her boyfriend heard actually heard the message. Yeah. Yeah, like the investigator heard it. Okay. So he was obviously, like I just mentioned, uh pretty alarmed at the amount of people that had been in and out, in and out of the house that day, possibly disturbing the scene of a potential crime but he wasn't at that point entirely convinced that there was a crime scene to have been disturbed um like i mentioned before like this area is not known for crime is not known for bad things happening so everyone just kind of thought like the girls and you know the women i guess i should say all just went out and hadn't returned right despite all the weird things they left behind that they would need such as the fact that Cheryl and Susie's cigarettes were left about, left behind, he noticed that right away because, like I mentioned before, chain smokers don't typically leave their cigarettes behind if they're leaving of their own volition because nicotine is a real drug and it's yeah. very addictive. And, you know, Cheryl was a chain, like a straight up chain smoker, like 
one after another, you know, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Rick book out decided to place these women as missing persons and he put on the report uh, foul play suspected so while he wasn't necessarily convinced that there was a crime here he did have enough sense to put some urgency behind the fact that they were missing and that they seemingly just disappeared and that kind of screamed foul play to him if they hadn't just walked out on their own Right. He decided to leave a letter and a little card with their number on it for the police department on Cheryl's front door, requesting that when she returned to please call the police department so they can cancel the missing persons report. And they intentionally locked the door, knowing that their keys were all inside. That was kind of the point because he knew that they would need police assistance to reg- regain entry into the home upon arrival. Okay, that's smart. Yeah. Because Janice, Stacy's mom, was like, why would you lock the door? Like, what if they get back and they want to get back in? And he was like, well, that's kind of the point. We want right. them to call us. We don't We don't want them to just dismiss the letter and come back in. Right, because right now it's an open missing persons case. Exactly. The following day, which was June 8th, and a, an official investigation began. David Asher was the lead investigator on the case. And he described that this case appeared that the women had been raptured. Have you ever heard that term? No. <laughs> so in the, and this is not like, a th- like not everyone thinks this necessarily, but um, in the, you know, Christian faith, like when the Lord returns and takes everyone back to heaven, um, everyone that is, you know, quote unquote worthy, I guess you could say, is raptured to heaven, leaving behind the people who either are destined for down there or they have their, um, I'm like explaining this so horribly, but there's like a a thousand years where they can repent and earn their way to heaven. But there is a series um, called Left Behind have you ever heard of that? No. It's got, um, what is that dude's name? Candace Cameron's brother. What's his name? You know what I'm talking Candace about? Candace Cameron has a brother? Yeah. He was How on. How did I not know that? He was on Growing Pains. I can't think of a stinking name right now, though. Showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever her brother's name is, but it was like a whole series about being raptured and like literally the people would just poof out of their clothes and just go to heaven. Okay, so. It's a good thing because you're going to heaven. Yeah, it's a good thing. Okay. Like, that word sounds so (laughs) negative to me. Raptured, yeah. It's like... Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's because, like, in the Bible, they talk about the rapture taking place. So, like, that's... Uh, But the guy who wrote that book and, like, made it sound like they literally just vanish out of their clothes and, like, like, you could just be driving down the road with your spouse and, like, poof, they're gone, and you're just, like, in the passenger seat, wrecked because, like, the rapture happened. Right. Jeez. Um, but that was, like, the way he described that case because it that's, that's seemingly weird. what happened. Yeah. Because, like, their clothes, their cars, their purses, their keys were all left behind, but them, like, their selves were gone. Right. Oh, that's and there was, weird. there was, like, no evidence, no sign of struggle, no blood. It appeared that they just literally vanished into thin air. Oh my god. Okay, that's really creepy, actually. <laughs> it is. But it's like, I mean, it is a really good way to describe it because, yeah. I mean, nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. It wasn't long before news of the missing ladies was all over the media. Most of the people believed that Cheryl, Susie, and Stacy would just show back up. But here we are, almost 30 years later, and they're still nowhere to be found. Oh, my God. And on that note, I'm going to pull a Haley, and I'm going to say you're going to have to stay tuned for the rest of this story on Monday's episode because it's a long one. It's a doozy. It's a long one. I still have five more pages of research to go over, Ah. and we're going to dive into the investigation, the theories, like the meat and potatoes of this case, I feel like. 
and it kind of I guess deserves its own its own episode so (laughs) oh my gosh I like I'm so excited that you're splitting it up because I know we're gonna like dive deep into it but also like I need to know I need to know I know it's so crazy oh my gosh I know well I'm excited for part two I like need to know what this investigation entailed yeah it's they're like in my eyes I think that they did a decent job investigating what happened to these girls based on the fact that they had like nothing to go off of yeah but there are some instances where they kind of maybe dropped the ball a little bit or didn't do a thorough search or um there was like some micromanaging going on Mm, interesting so we'll dive more into that next week on monday and yeah i hope you guys enjoyed what you've heard so far it's not enjoyable i say that every time i hate that i say that but you know what i mean (laughs) like if you like true crime it's enjoyable to listen to true crime cases like it's not happy but it's it is what it is yeah so make sure you guys are following us over on instagram because i will be posting pictures of these three beautiful women they were all very beautiful blonde hair athletic you know uh, Stacy had big blue eyes. Um, Susie and her mom had big brown eyes. They just look like just swell people that didn't do anything wrong and this horrible, tragic thing happened to them. So make sure you're following us on Instagram at inhuman underscore podcast. You can also find us on Facebook at inhuman, a true crime podcast. We're on TikTok at inhuman underscore podcast. Um, I am planning to post some content over there this week just to kind of um, talk about this case a little bit. Just, you know, a short yeah. little tidbit of what's going on. As always, if you have not left us, us, left us a rating and review on Apple, <laughs> make sure you head over there and do that. Um, follow us yeah. or subscribe on whatever platform you listen to us on. That's what I was going to say. A lot of people have messaged me saying, I listen on Spotify, so I can't give you guys a review. Yeah. Like, I'm so sorry. And, that you know, we understand. It's like, totally you're fine. Listening. But, yeah, keep listening. Keep following, subscribing, rating, reviewing, all of the things. Thank you guys always yeah. for listening. We appreciate all of your support so much. Um, so much. All right. Well, until next week, y'all keep it human. Bye.